Hello, and welcome to AMM Conversations, the official podcast of the Association of Medical Media. I'm your host, Jason Karras. This first season of AMM Conversations will explore the landscape and challenges of data privacy in the 21st century. My guest today is John Bigelow, Executive Director of the Coalition for Healthcare Communication. The coalition membership includes medical publishers, advertising agencies, marketing firms, scientific communication firms, point of care content providers, and digital platforms. John also is past president and current board member of the Association of Medical Media. Thanks for joining us, John. Let's get into the discussion. In a nutshell, where do we stand medical marketing, healthcare communications in 2020 with regard to data privacy? Well, data privacy has become a major issue in the country. Obviously, this is the age of big data. Big data has all kinds of advantages for us as citizens, and specifically in the healthcare arena, it has made it possible to improve clinical care by bringing together information that may have previously been in disjointed areas about electronic health records, insurance data, studies that may have been done by other clinicians to improve clinical care. It allows us to improve the clinical trial process by being better able to select patients, to identify patients within small rare disease subgroups where it's previously been difficult to even find candidates for trials to look at the data coming out of those trials and find signals of events that may have been obscured in the past, to use real world evidence in developing products. So a lot of advantages for clinical trials. Has a lot of public health advantages as well, which range from protecting the public, makes it easier to track the annual incidence of influenza or seasonal allergies, If there is a coronavirus or Ebola outbreak, it allows the tracking of that in a much more precise way than was previously possible. And it also serves some other public goods. For example, a big demand of the last few years has been to make sure that clinical trial data that previously may not have been published or may not have been widely circulated, this might often be negative results of trials, is publicly available. And the trend has been towards putting not only the trial on clinicaltrials.gov, but also the clinical data sets behind those trials. So there's a lot of ways that big data has public uses. As data has become a bigger issue and data privacy and security has become a bigger issue over the last 10, 15 years, The federal government has been reluctant to get involved in this area to a very great degree. Many of the companies involved in the data space, companies like Google or Facebook, are actually monopolies now, but the government has not taken the same antitrust approach that it would have taken in the era of the Standard Oil Trust or the railroads or the Bell Company or even trying to break up Microsoft years ago. It has taken the attitude that clinical and data innovation is going to provide consumer benefits that will avert the need for antitrust action. There have been concerns about the risks of micro-targeting, but the federal government has been willing to allow industry to self-regulate, and it has encouraged the formation of groups like, for example, the Digital Advertising Alliance to set standards in this area. So the federal government has taken a fairly passive role here over the years, pretty much hands off. But the anger has been building in the last few years among the public, and of course the government reflects the views of the public, so anger has been building among regulators and among politicians about a variety of issues that have come up in data, privacy, and security. Certainly there have been the big hacks of data which go across all different areas of our economy, whether it's financial data or some health data. There's been concerns that some of the major platforms like Facebook have allowed the use of personal data for purposes that the consumer had never intended. The Cambridge Analytica event was a big sea change in people's awareness of this. 
There's obviously been increased concern about fake news, conspiracy theories. A lot of that has popped up in the context of politics, but it has shown the hazards that can apply in healthcare as well, and people are very desirous of protecting their personal health data. The advent of deep fakes and new ways of misleading people, and now the concerns about artificial intelligence, facial recognition technologies, and things like that. The real fear that a lot of information that has been considered acceptable because it was, quote, de-identified, and that that information can now be re-identified to a very precise level raises all new levels of concern for the federal government. A number of things going on in D.C., but also at the state level. So it's kind of a two-pronged approach. You say that the federal government has been mostly hands-off, but there are some rumblings going on and some efforts on Capitol Hill. Would you like to talk about those first? Data privacy policy has been largely driven over the last couple of years by the European Union putting in place the GDPR, the Good Data Practices Regulation, which essentially added more specifics to the definition of what is personal data, instituted a very rigorous opt-in mechanism, and provided, at least officially, for very severe penalties. Now, of course, that was a European Union regulation, but many large American businesses will have a lot of European Union citizens in their databases and had to start to look at this very carefully. Then in 2019, California, clearly our largest state, representing something like an eighth of the American population, put in place the California Consumer Privacy Act. Very quickly designed legislation. It even to this day is still having to be clarified by new releases from the Attorney General of the state of California. So it's not even exactly sure how it's all going to work out, even though it officially went into effect on January 1st, 2020, and enforcement is supposed to begin on July 1st, 2020. And CCPA took more of an opting out emphasis so that a consumer has the right to know what data is being collected on them, where that data was collected from, what is being done with that data and by whom, and the ability to opt out of all of the above, and again with enforcement mechanisms. So a lot of the action has been driven by people outside the federal government looking at this as a policy of improving the mechanisms for consent or opting out. There are some problems with that when you look at it nationally. The first obvious problem is that if data is regulated by 50 different state laws, it makes it almost untenable from an industry perspective. A second problem is that the burden is being placed on the consumer. The burden to look when they try to load an app or go to a website or book a plane or get a Wi-Fi password in a public auditorium to have to go through a scroll of lengthy terms and conditions often written in fairly abstruse legally so even if you study it you don't really know what you're agreeing to. You're probably not going to study it. You're probably looking at it on a mobile or you may be faced with pop-ups that tell you that last seat is about to be sold or you're going to time out in seven seconds or things like that. Also, we have to remember that not everyone who looks at those terms and conditions is well educated. Many of the people may have English as a second language. Some of the people may not even have English as a first language. So to think that simply clicking I accept after scrolling through of that is informed consent is fairly laughable. So that's another major concern. A third area of concern is that as data technology advances, there are more and more areas where it's very difficult for an individual to truly provide informed consent. How do you get your consent for a CCTV camera to show you walking by and then identify that you were in a certain place at a certain time? What about all the companies that are now 
employing facial recognition technology? How do you give your consent to that? So there's a fear that many forms of data use are not even subject to individual consent. And then the fourth problem in this area is that the area in the federal government with responsibility for data regulation is the Federal Trade Commission. But the FTC was set up long ago with many other areas of focus, which primarily concern truth in advertising and antitrust action. It has only a very small group of people who are actually focused on privacy. It's very hard for the FTC to stay on top of all of the issues involved here, especially as data technology develops so quickly. So the federal government really has not acted yet. California has acted. The state of Nevada has now put in place its own bill, which is a little different than California. Several other states are at various stages of passing legislation. Most states have some form of legislation at some process in their legislatures. None of these bills agree. Many of these bills are put together without a lot of expertise on the problems. So there's a real potential for a major problem. Yeah, and I've heard it described as a potential administrative nightmare. Yes. The fragmentation of all of these privacy laws. There are some bills or some efforts now on Capitol Hill in the Senate. I think that you do see some potential light at the end of this tunnel. Yeah, I I think there's a bipartisan agreement on a couple of things. First, a bipartisan agreement that something needs to be done to protect the privacy and the security of people's data. And second, a bipartisan agreement that it needs to be done at a federal level. And despite the dysfunction in Washington, despite all the arguing over highly partisan issues, such as, for example, impeachment or the 2020 elections, this is one of the few areas where there is a lot of consensus on what needs to be done. So people are honestly trying to figure this out. There have been more than 20 bills on data privacy already introduced in this Congress. Some of those bills are, to be fair, individual congressmen or senators who are basically staking their claim to an interest in the area and probably are not going anywhere except to show interest in it. But there's also been significant work behind the scenes among various senators trying to come up with some platform for legislation. It's also important that in this area, industry is also trying to help. There is a movement that I think the medical publishing arena should know about that's been led by several industry trade organizations in the advertising community called Privacy for America. The effort's been sponsored by the 4As, the American Association of Advertising Agencies, the Association of National Advertisers, the uh, IAB, some other areas within this industry to try to set forth some principles that a privacy law should embody. And many of these principles are now becoming parts of legislative proposals that are being introduced both by Republican and Democratic members of the Senate Commerce Committee, which is the committee that has jurisdiction in the Senate. So what are those general parameters? The most important is to take a different approach, not an opt-in, opt-out approach, although obviously there will have to be components where a consumer has the choice of opting in or or opting out. But more broadly, to take the approach that why shouldn't the government be setting some guardrails in this important area, some general standards, just as the government sets safety standards for the introduction of automobiles, sets standards for monitoring the safety of drugs. There's a number of areas in the U.S. economy where the government sets standards because the consumer is not really in a great position to know how to interpret those standards, and this is one of them. So the main principles of this approach would be to create within the FTC or potentially outside the FTC a data protection agency that would be staffed with people who are expert in this and would be focused on data privacy and security. To define some acceptable areas of use of data and ways of collecting data. To then 
define some approaches to data collection or use which are, quote, per se unreasonable. These are things that companies should not be doing. And by, when I say companies, I should also note that this effort would incorporate nonprofits and other organizations, so not just businesses. Because technology moves along so quickly, the law has to be data agnostic. So there'd be provisions for how the data protection agency could update continually what is considered unreasonable or not unreasonable. The rules would surround data privacy, but they'd also surround data security. They would include some clear safe harbor provisions so that a business could be fairly certain that if they did certain things that were within that safe harbor, they were okay. But it would also include some rigorous penalties for companies that failed to stay within those rules. These bills are are basically two platforms, one that has been co-sponsored by the Republican senator who is the chair of the Senate Commerce Committee and one by the Democratic senator who is the ranking member of the Commerce Committee, with a lot of discussion among other members of that committee. I have not seen the drafts of that legislation. These have not been publicly submitted yet. But my understanding is that there are significant areas of overlap and agreement between these, certainly sufficient overlap to think that some version of this could be the platform upon which a final law is brought forth. Uh, There are a few areas that still need to be ironed out. One of those is in preemption of state laws. Do you preempt every aspect of state laws or do you preempt certain aspects and leave the states some room for activity? And another big thing is how do you enforce it? A law like the CCPA allows what's called a private right of action where an individual can determine that their data was used in a way that was not allowed by the CCPA, and whether there was harm to them or not, they can sue. Another way of doing this would be to make the restrictions enforceable by, for example, state attorneys general. So companies don't have to be at risk for millions of individual lawsuits, some of which may actually be frivolous, but would have to be very conscious of patterns which state attorneys general would obviously be going after. So these are things still to be ironed out, but there's a lot of consensus around this basic approach. We'll be right back after a message from the Association of Medical Media. Hi, I'm Todd Mundique, Executive Director of the Association of Medical Media. Just taking a pause here to thank you for listening to this episode of our podcast series on digital privacy. Whether it's the first episode or the last, we really hope that you're finding some nuggets and tidbits that you can put in use just as soon as the episode's over. Please don't hesitate to check out ammonline.org, our website, not only for updates on programming that we might be having, along with a host of resources that members can take advantage of, including recaps of previous educational sessions and our Medical Media Matters fact sheet, which will clue you into some research that might be helpful as you're talking to folks that you work with. As always, if we can be of any of assistance, we would be honored to do that. You can reach us at help at ammonline.org. That's also a great email address to use, help at amm.online.org. If you're not getting our weekly newsletter, we'd like to as well. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I hope you're enjoying this podcast series and let's get you back to this episode. Take care. Just kind of circling back to enforcement. I know that there's a lot of sort of gray area with regard to enforcement and we'd all like Facebook to be punished and Google to be slapped on the hand or maybe even more than slapped on the hand. Do you see enforcement, whichever way the legislation goes, as a major area of trouble? My supposition would be that lawyers who are looking to pursue suits usually will go where the money is and If you look at the American economy in general, or even marketing in general, there are probably bigger fish to fry than in the network of medical publishers or even more broadly of DTC advertising. Having said that, 
even if you're a small firm, if you are the one who is sued, it can mean a really bad day. In fact, a smaller firm is probably at more risk of going out of business from a terrible suit than a larger firm is. And it's also true that there is a lot of political skepticism of the value of pharmaceutical marketing. So any marketing and promotion in the healthcare space, whether it's to professionals or consumers, probably attracts more attention than it might just from its dollar volume. So definitely one has to be worried about this. So John, what are the data privacy questions your membership is asking? The types of questions we're hearing have differed depending on what part of the ecosystem you're talking about. For medical publishers and many of the media placement firms, a big issue was posed when Colorado last year passed legislation that was intended to affect the interaction between a detail rep and a physician and required that the list price of the detailed drug be revealed as well as the prices of up to three generics for the same indication. The way the law was written was not precise, so some agencies began believing that they had to exclude Colorado physicians from, for example, the mailing lists of journals or other advertising promotions. So we've had a lot of questions in the data privacy area around how do you deal with these types of state regulations, especially when they're not written in a very specific way. From advertising agencies, most of the concerns I've heard expressed so far are more in the cybersecurity side. What happens when data is breached? Who is liable in those situations and how liable are they? And when I hear from the scientific communications firms, it tends to be more about two other aspects of this problem. One would be the use of algorithms to try to discern patterns in the clinical data that might not otherwise be visible. And various communications firms may use these for purposes such as, for example, identifying patients who have some rare disease and then being able to target communications to them or target them for inclusion in a clinical trial or things like that. And then the second part of it is that the uh, publication planning world is very much under pressure to make sure that all clinical trial results get into the literature very quickly, including negative results, and to include the full data sets. There's a lot of concern whether, in fact, they can put the full data sets in the public purview or would that violate either today or against some regulation to come, gotcha. the data privacy regulations? And of course, once it's posted, it's out there for good, so it's hard to take it off the table. What about the issue that we've talked about previously, balancing data privacy with public goods? I think the attitude of our court system to date has been that an individual's right to privacy trumps a theoretical public good. But as the use of data becomes broader and as regulations become perhaps more specific, I think that's an issue that is going to be reevaluated in a number of ways. If the government is trying to get access to detailed data to track the spread of a coronavirus, to track perhaps the spread of a much more deadly illness like an Ebola virus as was an issue a few years ago, maybe that public good will have to trump the privacy right in some way. Similarly, the wish to have the ability to perform clinical trials on rare diseases, and in today's world, rare disease can be defined as diseases of some person who has a specific type of genetic abnormality that might be in a very tiny group of people. How do you balance that right against their right to privacy? This is going to be a difficult area, but I think we will have made a lot of progress if we can move the data privacy and security discussion to where we're talking about some of these very specific individual cases as opposed to the Wild West of feeling that our data is continually at risk in everything we do in our daily lives. Where do you see data privacy moving in the next six 12, 
even 24 months. I think we should assume that CCPA is the de facto standard in 2020. It probably will be in 2021 also. While there is some small chance that a bipartisan bill on data privacy and security could emerge from committee in 2020, the reality is that anything significant would need to pass before the summer when Congress will go into a lengthy recess as part of the re-election campaign. So really, it's much more likely that the legislation will pass in 2021, probably fairly high priority and early in 2021. Even then, it will take a little time to establish and staff a data protection agency and to write out all the details of the regulations. So the effective date is likely to be set at some point in the future. So whether that's January 1st, 2022, or potentially even later, and enforcement sometime later than that. So for the next two or three years, we have CCPA to deal with. We should do that. But I think everyone in this area should look very carefully at legislation that will emerge. When that legislation emerges, look at that carefully to see if it would be a favorable solution for this industry. I'm suspecting it will be, but of course anything can happen in the legislative meat grinder, so you never know what you don't know. But this is one area where I think it is hopeful, and I think that it will be in industry's benefit long term to have an approach that preempts state laws, so we have one federal standard that provides some safe harbor areas so you can have some confidence that most of the things we do probably will be in that safe harbor that has a specific bureau and set of regulations to guide things that may be more on the margin so you have some place to go to get some idea of what's going to happen and that also probably helps level the playing field at least a little in that in today's world, larger companies with scale probably have advantages in complying with some of the rules, and especially if there are multiple states coming out with rules, it becomes very difficult for a smaller company, whether that's a smaller publisher, a smaller advertising agency, or any other type of marketer, to really stay abreast and stay compliant with everything going on. Great. Again, I thank you very much. Would you like to let the listeners in on where they can find more information uh, from the coalition or from other assets you may have? Yes, I certainly invite everyone to go to the coalition website, which is www.cohealthcom.org. On that website, we post news on at least a weekly basis, often more often. There's often, there's also a repository of news from prior years in various categories related to health communications regulation and legislation. We also identify coming events. We have some other resources from previous conferences and certainly contact information to get on our mailing list. We do send out mailings on issues of note to people in our industry, a variety of issues that relate to health marketing and health communication. I had mentioned the Privacy for America initiative, so I'm, although this is not part of the coalition, I might also point people to a website that they have established where they do have a document that outlines the principles that they're working on. That is all for this episode of AMM Conversations, official podcast of the Association of Medical Media. Thank you for listening. Make sure to listen to more episodes on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you enjoy podcasts. More information on data privacy, including AMM's principles on online privacy, are available at ammonline.org. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in this podcast belong solely to the guests and not necessarily to the host, AMM, or any other group or individual.